If you would like to earn your MBA at a program famed for its collaborative student body with strong ties to tech as well as entertainment and media, plus it boasts a nice warm climate, then UCLA Anderson is for you. What's the secret to acceptance? Our guest today will tell you. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 484th episode of the Mission Straight Talk, Accepted's podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Before we get to our wonderful guest, I want to invite you to take advantage of a fantastic tool at Accepted, the MBA Admissions Quiz. Are you ready to apply to your dream MBA programs? Are you competitive at those programs? Accepted's MBA Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash MBA quiz, complete the quiz, which takes about five minutes, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to actually improve your qualifications. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash MBA quiz to obtain your complimentary assessment. It gives me great pleasure to have back on Admission Straight Talk, Alex Lawrence, Assistant Dean of MBA Admissions and Financial Aid at UCLA Anderson School of Management, which just happens to be where I earned my MBA. Alex is a fellow Anderson alum who earned his MBA in 1999. Prior to that, he earned a bachelor's in electrical engineering. After earning his MBA, he worked in management consulting for four years and then returned to UCLA Anderson as director of the Reardon program. In 2012, he became first director and then the assistant dean for MBA admissions. Alex, welcome back to Admissions Straight Talk. Hi, Leno. Thank you so much for having me back. My pleasure. Now, I'd like to start with just some general questions and then, you know, more like program questions and then move into admissions topics. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Can you give an overview of the Anderson full-time MBA program for those listeners who aren't that familiar with it, focusing on its more distinctive elements? Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, the UCLA Anderson MBA is one is obviously near and dear to my heart, being an alumnus of the program and now running the uh, admissions side of things. Uh, You know, my, my relationship with the school goes over 25 years. Uh, so I know it's hard to believe I'm only 35, but you know, <laughs> when I think about, you know, just in general, you your MBA at 10, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's our secret. Uh, when I look at like, um, you know, to just say the general overview, it is a full, it is a two-year program that balances uh, the opportunity to go through, say, the traditional um, core elements, uh, but also taking uh, what you learn in the classroom and actually participate in a number of different um, experiential or practicum type of activities. We actually started school yesterday. So today is really? day two, yeah, for the class of 24. One of the things I think just shows how we're always innovating in our program is that, you know, beside, beyond just like the, say, the traditional of doing perhaps a summer internships, more and more of our students are doing um, academic internships. Yeah. We uh, also have a uh, part of the graduation requirements. You have to satisfy a global requirement. So our students have been taking on some of those uh, different opportunities uh, almost uh, 10 years now uh, where they do a consulting project with a global company or perhaps they travel overseas. And I know we'll talk about some of those elements. We're a smallish class size of around 330 students. Um, we're one such that we don't necessarily just look at students with just a business background. It's really diverse, domestically, international, gender, also career interests as well. So we have students going to a lot of different areas, not just consulting and finance, but real estate, entertainment, and more. Uh, we could talk more about that too. And I think just like, just again, just showing how uh, some of the distinctive elements of what we're always trying to uh, say, uh, push the envelope on is that we did add as part of the core class in order to graduate this year is a course in ethics. So students have to participate in that. Our career services, there's a required class as well um, that our students have to take in. So a lot of different elements that, you know, once you sort of peel back the layers and you, you learn more about Anderson, there's a, there's a lot to find out. Um, I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about a lot of that and more. Sure. 
Well, you, you've touched on some, some things in terms of what's new. Now, I mean, courses in, let's say, corporate social responsibility have been around for a long time. How does the Anderson course in ethics, let's say, differ from the traditional corporate social res responsibility courses? Yeah, sure. So I think like when you look at how, uh, say, the just the topic of ethics, many times it's weaved into some other elements of maybe some elective courses, uh, maybe some case studies. I remember this is pre-pandemic where uh, the students who we always uh, work hand in hand in, in, in innovating our curriculum, they wanted to uh, create basically an all-day conference on ethics, which included a case competition at the end that really uh, showcased the interests of not just the current students, but sort of this wave of interest of even prospective candidates in the topic itself. The faculty did get together with administration, and you know, while it took a while to finally make this part of the core, it is such that during that 10 weeks, um, the students are going to, again, have the opportunity to really get a little bit deeper at the foundation elements of what is what are ethics. Of course, I think, like most MBA programs, the first day of school, right, all the students, right, uh, they sign this code of conduct, right, you know, spanning accountability and what uh, doing uh, inside and outside the classroom, uh, but some of the other things that I think about just shows the innovation of like even building up this ethics course, which again, we'll use case study as an opportunity to do a practicum around it as well. Um, of course, uh, featured speakers, things that they can take into their summer internship and even after they graduate. It's just really more of an opportunity that just sort of like resonates with our students who um, are looking to change that sort of experience for those, uh, including grade non-disclosure and things of that nature. So, you know, all these things, I think, are connected to the idea and, and topic of ethics that, again, we've been teaching throughout different courses in the past. But now it's just a main focal point of one particular class as part of the graduation requirements. OK, great. Now, you touched on this in, in your response to my first question, and that is some, several of the distinctive aspects of the Anderson program today. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the in-year internships, the applied management research, which was called field study in my day, way, way, way back in prehistoric times. And also, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but Anderson also provides students with the option to launch a business during their MBA. Is that correct? So that is correct. Talk, touch, just touch on those three points for a minute. Yeah, sure. So the applied management research process or project, um, you know, like you said, field study, even when I was in school, it really gives students an opportunity to basically do like a mini consulting project. You create your own teams, um, you bid on one of over a hundred different projects that spans a number of different industries. And really for those like myself, who was a uh, Chris Richard wanted to go into management consulting, it's a really great opportunity to work with a yeah. company that has a real business challenge. Um, and that basically starts with you developing, again, creating your own team at the end of the first year, and you actually have a deliverable in the middle of the second year. Uh, another option um, for our students is that, especially if you're focused more on the entrepreneurial sort of roadmap, is it's called the Business Creation Project. Uh, so BCP, we changed it from B BCO um, this past year. And again, this is one where, uh, like you know, the idea or the concept of an entrepreneur Venture might sound, you have an idea, um, you get a chance to build your team, you get an opportunity to work with our Price Center for Entrepreneurship, one of uh, eight research centers that we do have. Um, you get to leverage our Venture Accelerator, one of our uh, eight incubators on the UCLA campus. And in that sense, you get just access to really how to build out your, your plan, depending on what you need, funding, board members, et cetera. You get wow. exposed to a lot of those uh, different partners. And the other opportunities, and you know, there's there's more now than just the uh, AMR um, and the BCP. You can also do uh, be a part of the Anderson Strategy Group to satisfy that crime. So again, it's like it's a partnership model. Um, all students, again, they get a chance to uh, pick the type of projects they want to work in on UCL campus or outside. You can do uh, asset management by oh, being wow. part of the student investment fund where you manage uh, over a million dollars of the school's funds. So there's a lot of different ways to now satisfy that uh, graduation requirement that was really just sort of singular in nature when you and I were in school. Right, right. And the in-year internships, that's that's entirely separate, right? Totally separate. And it's one where, you know, based off of like my own research, I've seen now like over 70% of our current students participate in some type of 
engagement where really while the Parker Career Management Center does support our students, it's not necessarily say quote or a graduation requirement. Um, some start that opportunity because they're career switchers, you know, sure. and they they see the uh, sort of the opportunity or the need to like really kind of transform their resume. So some start that opportunity as early as the winter quarter of their first year. So January, some I've heard have done up to say five different intern academic internships during the course of two years. And that might be say in that area of like, say, uh, an entertainment and media where they know that the, the recruiting process is definitely different than, say, financial services or consulting. So they know that getting the opportunity to doing these short-term projects, uh, getting their name out there, doing some networking, which are all also the benefits, are really important for to help them make that career switch. Sure. So they can they can do multiple internships. They can also do a full-time internship in the summer. This is not a, an either-or kind of choice. They can do the summer internship and then one, two, three, four, five in class. Absolutely. For them. Absolutely. And, and it's become um, sort of a, a great phenomena where uh, some of these opportunities get handed down from, say, second years to first years wow. um, because the so called clients or some of these engagements have had such a great experience, right? Maybe some of these groups aren't necessarily looking for something as long term as a, a summer internship and they need more of like a, a short term type of uh, uh, academic firepower, so to speak, you know. Um, it's like part time. Students. Yes, and it's part-time as well. Right. Now, you mentioned the global graduation requirement, and there are global immersion courses and experiences at Anderson. What about COVID? Have you been able to resume those? Yes. Uh, yes, we have. So I was looking at the uh, schedule. Literally, uh, an email came through um, yesterday where there's going to be an opportunity to uh, travel to India um, wow. in December. Um, so they're taking applications for that. I know that earlier this year, or actually, I'm sorry, in September, I believe that they're going to be um, visiting uh, the Czech Republic. And so that is definitely uh, in full swing. I know a number of uh, students went on a trip to Dubai last December. So it was that December 21. So yes, you know, of course, obviously, we're going to make sure our, our students and faculty um, travel safely. Um, sure. um, so I'm taking all the necessary precautions. But yeah, our students are right back on track of like exploring all these great opportunities on and off the Anderson campus. That's great. What don't people know about Anderson that you would like them to know? Oh, great question. You know, I think, Linda, you know, as, as much travel as I've been doing before the pandemic and afterwards, what I see is that few have taken the opportunity to come on the UCLA Anderson campus. And I understand it. Uh, one of the things that I wish people would know, you know, thinking about um, some of the advantages of going to school, top ranked program like UCLA Anderson, going to school in Los Angeles has a lot of great benefits. And one of those is that the fact that from a work-life balance, you know, you know I'm going to put all the, the beaches and the sunshine to the side, but thinking about here you are here you are in a part of the country where, again, it's not all just about the entertainment media capital of the world, but uh, we have Silicon Beach, uh, which is great for those who are in focus on, say, a career in tech. Yeah, you can definitely do uh, go up there to the Bay Area as well. We are very vibrant and have, have great career opportunities in the finance arena up and down the West Coast. Um, yes, you can still make that transition back to the East Coast. But I think at the core of all that, you know, is that as people are thinking about top ranked programs, I would say that uh, we have our Parker Career Management Center, which top ranked career management center, especially as it pertains to boosting the ROI. Um, I think that's something that's always on people's minds these days sure. about the MBA, how the Park Career Management Center can get you to your, your stated goals post-MBA. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's turn to the application itself. I think you've given a great introduction to the program. Of course, there's a lot of change, dynamism in terms of testing in the application process in general. Do you see Anderson at any point in time either accepting the executive assessment for the full-time program or other aptitude tests in addition to the GMAT and the GRE, or perhaps issuing test waivers or going test optional? So I won't say no, because um, we are constantly talking about, again, what in terms of for applicants do we need? You know, you know, again, the old model that many of the schools, including Anderson, have leveraged is standardized tests transcripts, when you have these different testing vehicles, like you mentioned, uh, the EA and others, um, our history does show that we 
have adjusted to the mark to the market. You know, we accepted the GRE like other schools many years ago. Again, we're looking and evaluating the EA. Some of the other programs under the UCLA Anderson portfolio suite do accept the EA, in particular our part-time MBA program. So I'm not going to say no, um, but uh, we're looking at that. You know, you talk about test waivers um, and other sort of vehicles right now. Uh, we're not providing test waivers, but we're talking, you know, we're, yeah. we're talking with our all, all of our partners, including current students, trying to understand, you know, some of the, the challenges of applying uh, to business school. And that does include the financial burden um, that some of the students are coming to the program. So um, right now, uh, in the short term, uh, no, we're not providing, say, test waivers or looking at other different types of uh, testing vehicles, but uh, we're talking about it and literally was in a meeting earlier today kind of saying like, okay, as we're looking at not just for the class of 25, but, you know, evaluating the what uh, class of 24 coming in and hearing about their stories, uh, opportunities that they are more interested in, and then also thinking about what we can do beyond, uh, say, the, the class of 24, 25, 26 in the future. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of it's a very interesting environment to be working in. There's a lot of lot in flux. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, I'm I don't have the exact date, but I know that you know some of the one of those schools in the Northeast just sort of changed its course. Um, at, really? at least at the undergraduate level, right, and then maybe right, the graduate right. level. So you know, it's like just keep constantly monitoring, and you know, you know, we <laughs> we we look at all of our so-called competitors in the market, and we see which ones are providing some of those resources, and some are not. And so UCLA yeah. Anderson is not the only school. It's also interesting because sometimes I'm talking informally to admissions directors, even admissions directors where their school is issuing waivers or has gone test optional, you sense, I really wish they would take the test, <laughs> especially those people who can't demonstrate quant skills. Yeah, you're, 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 you're spot on. I mean, one of my major concerns, and I think shared throughout UCLA Anderson is that you know, when we're looking to bring people onto our campus, um, we want to make sure that they are going to be successful inside and outside the classroom, right? We don't pride ourselves at all of, of admitting people and not having them, you know, finish. So just being realistic, that's why throughout the application process and even before that, you know, communicating, like letting people know what they're going to be up against, you know, yeah. so it's not an easy process. And to your point, you know, we're, we're trying to collect as many sort of data points, as many sort of um, pieces of evidence from the individual just to make sure that once they get put inside a group of very talented individuals with different backgrounds and, you know, people are going to be uh, successful. And of course, yeah, there's going to be those moments where there are going to be challenges. Everybody's going to have some moments where they they stumble a little bit throughout the MBA experience, but we don't want anybody to have that experience from beginning until graduation. So uh, like you, I've had those informal conversations with admissions directors and hearing sure some- you've had more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and hearing some of those challenges of people who are providing some of those things like test waivers, application fee waivers, whatever, um, and then just hearing sort of like, you know, the, the challenge to really get what they need in absence of maybe a standardized test or right. an application fee. So right. the thing is, is that um, some are continuing to experiment with it and put it in place and let's just see uh, if it's going to stick. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting times. Now, Anderson is very admirably clear about what it values in terms of its of the website. Not all schools are so clear. Um, and the website says that Anderson values people who share success, think fearlessly, and drive change. Now, applicants who share those values will naturally be drawn to, to, to Anderson. How can they convey that they share those values via their application? Uh, great question. So when you look at all of the different materials that people need to submit. There's just some natural parts of say that real estate that people can put down, say, for example, the shared success. You have your resume. You know, there's great opportunities to put down hobbies, interests, as an example there. You can also obviously share that in your essays. So there's a lot of control around that. And that's where we really want to know who you are as a person. We want to know you have a plan about getting an MBA. Two, um, another area is the interview itself. 
that's just a great way to have a conversation with a current MBA student who does facilitate the interview. And in that sense, that interviewer who's been trained is going to be looking for those qualities. They're going to be asking you about, you know, not only why you want to get an MBA, why you want to get an a MBA from Anderson. So that's a great way for a candidate to showcase their knowledge about the program, their uh, interests or plan on how they're going to make an impact on the campus in and of itself. Um, the transcripts, the standardized test score, that's all going to show us your ability to do well academically, as well as in some cases, if you may have had an academic you know, challenge in your undergrad, show us how you uh, may have rebounded, okay? Um, the letters of rec, another way to demonstrate, you know, how from a, a third person about some feedback maybe you received and how you responded, your highest level of qualities um, that you did in the workplace or whatever community organization you provided. So there's just a lot of different ways to be strategic about how am I going to show UCLA Anderson? This is the community that I want to be a part of that values all those that you mentioned. And I know with the first two, you know, uh, think fearlessly, drive change. You know, many schools talk about how they have very smart people. They're they're changing the world, right? Um, and Anderson, you know, values that too. But we really believe we own that third piece, the shared success model. And like I mentioned before, in all those areas, there's just different ways that you can showcase that and say, like, okay, I'm part of a community. I made it better. Um, I'm going to do the same thing at Anderson. Okay, great. Thank you. That was a wonderful answer. What happens to an application after the applicant hits submit? So really, there's a couple of parallel processes going on between our admissions and operations team in that one part of the process is that, you know, we want to make sure that we do an assessment of the entire pool of applications for analysis purposes. You know, we want to make sure we share it with the right key stakeholders here on the campus as we get ready and prepare for other parts of the application process. For example, one is that um, we're going to be uh, having uh, some people evaluate the application in and of itself. Uh, there are individuals who have a specific skill set and awareness about different regions around the world, uh, professional backgrounds, academic institutions. And at the same time, um, we're also getting our interviewers ready. Uh, we're doing some tweaks on that to make sure that when we identify the applications that we want to push forward for interviewing invitations, that we can quickly put those, uh, invite those individuals um, so they can see the different interviewing slots in person or hybrid. Oh, really? um, yeah. So it can be either virtual or in person. Yes, exactly. Okay. And and we've been doing that even before uh, pre-pandemic because I know many times people are asking like, is there sort of like a knock against my application if I don't do it in person, you know? And it's just like, no, that's not the case at all. So uh, we were doing using video technology before Zoom um, in that case. And then for those who are fortunate enough to get an interview, like I mentioned before, interviewers are trained. They know what to look out for. They write up their report. Another set of eyes uh, reviews the application again. I get an opportunity myself also to read all the applications and you know to sort of wrap up the process. Um, we have a faculty committee that looks at the applications that we want to recommend for admission. And then we have a graduate program here at UCLA that also verifies a lot of uh, sort of the application materials, including the official transcripts from different institutions. And then eventually we uh, send out the notice for being admitted to the program. That's the best part. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then, uh, like I said, you know, for me, the fact that you know, I see these applications sort of very early on in the process and then days like yesterday, where in some cases I'm able to put faces to the actual written parts, even though I do see the photos in the, in the applications themselves. Yeah. It's, it's it really kind of is like full circle. Right. Yeah, that must be, that's uh, definitely a perk of the position that mm -hmm. you're in. Now, you, I know you, you said that the interview is either in person or or virtual, that you basically, you, you have a hybrid model, but what is the interview like? Is it behavioral? Is it walk me through your resume kind of questions? Yeah, it's a little bit of all that. Um, okay. Because, you know, like I mentioned, they are second year MBA students uh, at Anderson. So, you know, while our training does include, you know, asking individuals, please 
walk me through your resume. These are things that our, our students have already done, right? Um, as they like get ready for their internships or things of that nature in those interviews. So walk me through your resume. They're going to ask you about your plans on why you want to get an MBA. Why is this the right time in your career to do so? Why do you want to get an MBA from UCLA Anderson? Okay, and they do it in such a way where, again, they're they're looking for awareness. They're looking for the fact that you have a plan. They're looking for evidence about how Anderson can get you to that specific uh, career focus. Um, they also want to know if you're knowledgeable. Okay, when right. people talk about they want to go into management consulting, you know, asking about maybe a specific firm or the uh, the service lines. They want to see you've done your homework. You know, because sure. And Anderson, like we put everything out there, you know, you look at our website, our employment report, et cetera, it's all there. So people should be aware and know, like, again, how can the different resources, faculty, classes, career management center, you name it, are going to help. Not that you have to name every single thing, but being knowledgeable about the school is, is important. And then the last thing, you know, I would say, which is really important because it's more of a casual thing, the MBA student is going to be looking, is this the kind of individual who we want in our community, who's going to be giving back, who's going to succeed in the classroom and outside the classroom, that they're going to be a lifelong member of the UCLA Anderson family. So all those things, behavioral, um, also just awareness about the school, having a plan, those are all very important in that all can get done in 30 minutes. Wow. That sounds like a packed interview. Yes, it is. And, you know, I would say that for most people who do receive the uh, invitation to interview, it's really an opportunity for you to close the deal. You mm -hmm. put all the hard work into the application, ideally wrote the essays, letters of recommendation, et cetera. It is a blind interview. Um, so all they get is your resume. So really here's a great opportunity just to close the deal. And if I, I would say the applicants who do extremely well or who are successful, they've done all that homework. They've come oh, on yeah. campus, they've talked to all the, so it's like really, just like I said, very casual conversation. And who knows, next thing you know, when they're asking, how did you hear about Anderson? And if the interviewee mentions a specific person or event, that student is going to know more often than not that individual or they know of that event. So then it's just like, yeah, that may have been something that was like critical in them choosing Anderson themselves. Right. And what percentage of interviewed applicants are, are sent offers of admission approximately? So we interview about 70% of all our applications, and okay. then much less than that are actually um, accepted. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold the cards to the vest okay. right now on that okay. specific number. <laughs> okay, okay. But uh, regardless, if you're invited to interview, your chances are much higher of acceptance. It's uh, right. Online. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, I have seen in some cases where you know, like everything looked great on paper, got the interview. Then I read the interview report. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, and I can tell, you know, by the answers, not much awareness about like who UCLA Anderson couldn't name a specific club that would be instrumental in there or how they would give back. And it was just like a really flat interview. And, and again, that's what makes it easy too. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Sure. Sure. Let's say I apply to Anderson last year or two years ago and I wasn't accepted but I really want to go to Anderson. What advice would you have for me? Yeah, a great question. So uh, every year we give feedback to people who have applied and were denied. Uh, we have a short window of time at the end of the application so people can call and talk and we can really give them specific feedback. The fact, like I mentioned earlier, if you look on our website, we give the, the profile, okay? Not that we need or looking for people with high test scores or GPAs, I always tell people you definitely, at least as it pertains to those numbers, you want to be in the ballpark. That's why we get ranges. So, you know, having some self-awareness about that piece of like, okay, check those stats first, make sure you're in the ballpark. If not, take the opportunity, improve those numbers. Maybe your quant profile is a little bit low, take an additional class, get an A, then move on to the next part. The other thing that I would say that you know, when you think about what are your goals for getting an MBA, don't tell us what you think we want to hear. Tell us and be authentic about, I want to get my MBA. I'm at a point in my career that, you know, fill in the blank. If this is your career switcher, you know, be authentic about that. Be very intentional about how maybe you have some transferable skills that'll be, um, you, that you can translate to the next job function or industry that you're trying to make that transition to. Um, talk to students 
as much as possible. Um, I know it sounds like such an easy thing to do, um, but once you start talking to them, you get a good sense of like how they apply successfully. And trust me, some of those students who may have been in that position who applied the first time and then didn't necessarily get admitted, they, you know, they applied again and were, they are some of our biggest advocates for being a part of our admissions ambassador corps, which has over 140 students. So there's plenty of resources that in some cases are willing to kind of give you feedback themselves on your application, hearing your essays, seeing your interviewing skills so that you can take all that good input including what I mentioned, what our staff provides. And then you're like, okay, now I'm ready. And then maybe, you know, in some cases you applied at a period of during the application year, maybe round three, where there's very few seats yeah. remaining. Um, maybe you didn't put together as competitive an application for the, from that timing standpoint. Here's a great opportunity because again, we don't hold that against anybody who's applied and was have been rejected before tweak up your your resume a little bit we have application boot camps that occur in uh, november and december of each year so again there's just a lot of different resources that basically started a couple months ago where you can get to learn about the ucla anderson experience talk to a lot of people i'm on the road myself so i get these type of questions too i was just in houston sure. dallas and chicago two weeks ago so it's it, i don't want to make it sound very easy but it's like it's there for people to really take control over and put together the best application that they possibly can yeah it's a it's a demanding process it's a time-consuming demanding process and uh yeah but i think you gave a, a great answer thank you again thank you what what would you say to applicants who want to apply this year but are concerned about the possibility uh, or the reality, depending upon your perspective, of a recession? Oh, yeah, great question. So I think at the end of the day, you know, when you see or hear a lot of these external forces that may worry you or encourage you, I'm always going to say that you should apply to the MBA when you're ready. Okay, mm -hmm. don't do it because it's um, maybe something that is in vogue, um, or is somebody's telling you to do it? Again, I mentioned this earlier. You know, why do you want to get an MBA? Uh, yeah, on the horizon, there's going to be potentially a recession, and it, a recession has happened in the past. And, and when you talk to people who kind of went through that period and applied during that period, they'll tell you it was still the best decision for them at that time, and it really set them up for the long term. So again, an MBA is not for everybody. I'm, I'm a little bit of a homer in the sense that like, I got my MBA. I'm, I'm also sort of uh, selling an MBA, the, the power of it. I got a, another advanced degree in engineering, and I, I see like the MBA being so much more versatile. Oh, yeah. um, I've used it to make a couple pivots in my career, um, and I've seen others do it too as well. So you know, when people are kind of worried about cost, uh, recession, um, things of that nature. I always tell them to think about it's an investment in yourself. Um, do your homework, though. Make sure you do your homework because, like you said, it is hard. It is a big time commitment. There's the opportunity cost as well. Um, but like I said, I haven't met anybody yet. You know, I've been around in the game for 25 years. I've met anybody who said this was a bad decision that I did get my MBA, you know, and I spent all this money or whatever. I think for the most part, like 99%, 100% of the people um, would say, yes, best decision in my life. Some of, some would talk about the, the career advantages of it. Some will talk about the people, the network, the, um, some experience. Talk about the experience, some will talk about how it changed their lives. Um, and I think those are the things that, you know, as part of the research to consider, but at the end of the day, it's got to be the right choice for you and at the right time. Right. No, I completely agree. You know, uh, GMAC data, you know, the alumni surveys show overwhelming satisfaction, both mm -hmm. with the ROI, the experience, the job opportunities afterwards. I don't know that it's 99% or hundred percent, but <laughs> it was, it was very, very high. Mm -hmm. Certainly the kind of satisfaction that many companies can only dream of. What candidates are you not seeing enough of in the applicant pool? Oh, great. Uh, another great question on your part. So I think it, particularly this year, and we're not alone, it's just that uh, there's not enough domestic applicants, you know, okay. um, you know, tight labor market, things are going really well for people, even those who did apply. Um, in the end, some are deciding to stay because their employer is aggressively recruiting them <laughs> to stay. So that's one um, area. Again, I think in general, the overall industry is such that we're always looking for uh, more women to apply to business schools. And, you know, there's not enough of that great talent 
that um, can supply all of the top business programs. And then uh, underrepresented minorities, same thing. There's just not enough uh, great talent to supply all of the top business schools. So I wish that, you know, um, again, being greedy, that we would get all of that coming to UCLA Anderson. <laughs> but I know that we're competing from coast to coast worldwide for that type of talent. Um, and again, just because I've been around for so long here at the school, I've seen how much our community has grown each year when we've seen more diverse talent like that I've described coming into onto the campus, into the classroom. I've seen conferences built up. I've seen, um, you know, I have a, a mighty team of five and, and, you know, that gets expanded to 500 when I started including the students and the alumni. And, you know, when, I, when I'm in these uh, different cities and I just say, hey, you know what, you know, if you don't, you know, understand what I'm saying, I'm only, you know, different uh, representative, but I have somebody so I connect them with the student who may be um, doing an internship locally or, or uh, for them to an alumna from the same undergrad institution. And next thing you know, I just see sort of like the connections start happening, the relationships building, the excitement and all that and more. So, uh, but quickly, like I said, those are like the three that quickly come to mind, more domestic applicants, women, and I'm going to represent minorities. Great. Thank you for your response. And, and if I can add just one sure. more, just sure. because it makes me think about how uh, with uh, being out here in Los Angeles, again, many times people, especially on the finance or in the finance arena might think like, you know what, Anderson's probably not for me. I'm going to go to maybe a school in the East Coast because I want to be on Wall Street. Our students do extremely well. We want to make that transition uh, from the West Coast back to the East there on Wall Street or even stay out here on the West Coast and uh, pursue a career in finance as well. So would love to see that type of profile or career interest as well. Okay, great. Thank you for adding that. Mm -hmm. Now, if if I'm an applicant and I'm not ready to apply this year for whatever reason, I, I, I don't have enough work experience, I want to do some GPA repair, I haven't taken whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking ahead to a 2023 or 2024 application, in other words, next fall or two years even, what is the one thing you would do if you were in my shoes to prepare yourself to apply? Oh, so another great question. And thing I would say, and I mean, it's it sounds so easy to do, but it's like, do the research, okay? And um, I know, you know, so, well, what does that mean? Like, I we put so much time and effort into our into our website. There's so much information on there about how to get started. You know, are, if you're interested, like should I take the GMAT or the GRE? Can I talk to a student? It's like it's all there. And if you're like, wow, that's a lot of work. I'd rather talk to somebody. That's possible too. You can go to our events webpage and see like, okay, is there something coming to my town where I can actually speak with an admissions officer, an alumnus, or even a current student so they can give me the quick version, you know? There's, it's, it's like, it's all there. So even if you're confused about which part, how do I start, even if I'm not looking until say fall of 23, actually speaking with somebody and saying like, okay, where are you at? So I can understand where are you in the process? Do you need to take a standardized test? Are you, do you know why you want to get an MBA? I know that dialogue is important and maybe sometimes just being in the room with somebody who is applying like now and you hear about their journey, just like, oh, okay, now I understand what are the table stakes. You know, maybe I do need to study for this GRE or GMAT. I just can't wake up and roll into it. I'm like, oh, maybe I do need a certain number of years of experience for a specific professional career that I'm looking at doing versus just maybe I just graduated two months ago. So, you know, all that being said, you know, it's as it, 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 it's complex as I'm making, I hope I'm trying to make it simple, like go to the website because then it'll connect you with the type of resource you may need at that time, whether it be a person or some type of, you know, tech context about like the timeline or even going to an information session that I sometimes are hosted by myself or one of my team members or even alumni of the program. Thank you. That's a great answer. What would you have liked me to ask you? Well, I think you asked a lot of great questions and I kind of snuck it in there earlier about like, what do people not know? And I, I always throw in that Parker Career Management Center piece because of the fact that, you know, our research shows in addition to, you mentioned GMAC as well, one of the top two reasons you're probably going to get an MBA is career related. Absolutely. And if career services is going to be a critical part of that process for you, then looking at 
a school's uh, services in that area is going to be important. So our Park Career Management Center is each year voted top two, top three, if not number one, um, for career services in, in terms of student satisfaction. They have so many resources available that not all of our students can take advantage of everything. But I mentioned some earlier, you have to take a class um, in order to graduate where they'll talk about how to negotiate on your offer. Uh, how do you do interviewing? Um, they'll do days on the job events. Um, you get not only a, a counselor who has industry experience, and works with you one on one, but you also have a second year student who can be a TA who can talk about like the process of like maybe you're focusing on a specific industry. And there's more and more and more. And, you know, I, I, I can go on, but, you know, just trying to keep it real short and sweet. The thing I love about the Park Career Management Center is that I see the relationships and the care and the dedication that each one of those individuals puts into our students and helping them understand the opportunity. And it's a partnership. So they put you in the best position to succeed. Remember, I was talking about the interviewing process sure. as admissions. They kind of can they keep that continuum going so that they're going to put you in a great position for you to close the deal. And many times the happy challenge or problem that our students have is that not only did I get my dream job, but I've got a couple other other offers that I wasn't considering before. And now which one do I take? And I think that's a great position to be in. That is a great position to be in. Thank you so much. Alex, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Where can listeners and potential applicants learn more about Anderson's full-time MBA program? Yes, you can go to anderson.ucla.edu forward slash full-time MBA and learn more. Um, of course, you can always Google me, Alex Lawrence, UCLA Anderson. You'll see me all over the place on our website. And uh, by all means, people can email me or my team. We would love to hear from you and share more about the opportunity in our program. Wonderful. Thank you again. We're going to include links in the show notes at accepted.com slash 484 to UCLA Anderson's full-time MBA program site as well as to other related articles, including Anderson Student Interviews. They're all linked to from exhibit.com slash 484. Quick reminder, don't miss the MBA admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at exhibit.com slash MBA quiz. Listener, thank you too for joining Alex Lawrence and me for our 484th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, please subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any future shows, be they with admissions deans, professors, current students, test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. Thanks again for coming. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 